Well, we have read thus far in our call to worship the last few verses of Genesis chapter 8. Now we come to Genesis 9, same context for our scripture reading. And now God speaks to Noah. Verse 1. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, and on all that moves on the earth, and all the fish of the sea, they are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I've given you all things, even as the green herbs. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely, for your lifeblood, I will demand a reckoning from the hand of every beast. I will require it, and from the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. In recent days in the United States, we have seen widespread violence on the part of rogue police and on the part of the ignorant mob. And we are considering study number two this morning, the word of God to America in these days. We have thus far considered the first point there in your outline. God says in the sixth commandment, pay attention to it, pay attention to the sixth commandment. We reflected upon the proper translation of Exodus 20 and verse 13, particularly the Hebrew word ratzak, and it's best translated here, as it is in the New King James, you shall not murder. We reflected on the substance of the divine mandate in the outstanding statement from John Calvin, quote, all violence, injury, and any harmful thing at all that may injure our neighbor's body are forbidden to us. We must never harm someone's body. That is the sixth commandment. And then we reflected on point 1C, this commandment also beyond suicide, the old American custom of gentlemen, so-called gentlemen, dueling, and abortion. We come now, though, to point number two, what the commandment does not mean. We want to spend a few moments reflecting upon this. There is confusion in the evangelical community on these issues, and it's important that we, the Reformed, be clearly on this subject. What the commandment does not mean does not prohibit capital punishment. Secondly, it does not forbid homicide in self-defense. Thirdly, it does not disallow killing in a time of war. And then we shall reflect on point number three, the nature of the transgression of this mandate. We begin then with 2A, it does not prohibit capital punishment. There are those and governments across the world and various of the states in the United States which do prohibit capital punishment. An example is the European Union, which has an absolute ban on the death penalty in all circumstances. Scripture takes a different view and teaches that it is, in fact, obligatory in certain situations. Scripture also says that it must be exercised with extreme caution. In fact, there must never be mistakes. There is no room for a mistake. On the other hand, though, God demands that the guilty be punished in the case of homicide. We see this before the law of Moses was given. We see this in Genesis 9, 
We left off the reading in verse 5. Notice with me now verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. This is the commandment of God. The earth before the Noahic flood was an extremely dangerous place. Here in Genesis 6 and verse 11 we read, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. In verse 13 we read, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. That was the dominant characteristic of human society. In the 17th century, Thomas Hobbes, who was by no means a Christian, wrote a book called Leviathan, reflecting on the period of time before human government. And he did have an accurate insight as to what life was like, and it matches scripture. He made that famous statement that life was nasty, brutish, and short and that people lived in continual fear of suffering a violent death. And God said enough. And that's why in Genesis 9, 6, we have this new mandate. By man, his blood shall be shed. There are numerous passages in the Mosaic law which say exactly the same thing. Exodus 21, 12, Leviticus 24 17 Deuteronomy 19 11 and following and this continues into the New Testament it's not just an Old Testament thing in Romans 13 1 and following Paul speaks about the governing authorities and that they are appointed by God and he says in verse 4 writing to the church in Rome if you do evil be afraid for he does not bear the sword in vain. The sword that the state wields is not a decoration to be placed above your fireplace and to be admired in terms of the metals in it. He does not bear the sword in vain, says the Apostle Paul. He says, for he is God's minister an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. On the other hand, the word of God is very clear. There must be extreme care. There is no room for mistakes. In Numbers 35, 30, we read this, whoever kills a person, the murderer, shall be put to death. On the testimony of witnesses, and it's put in the plural, witnesses, not one witness. In fact, it says one witness is not sufficient against a person for the death penalty. Sad to say in the United States, occasionally you hear of cases where the whole case rests on one witness. Once again, our courtrooms and our law totally disconnected with the fundamental principles found in the law of God. There is a reason why some Christians are opposed to capital punishment, and it is because at times there is the unrighteous administration of that penalty. There have been executions in the United States on the basis of one witness. And we have gone contrary to what God demands. Even if there are multiple witnesses, one has to be very careful because multiple witnesses, two or three, even can lie. There must be extreme caution. There must be certainty. There is no room for a mistake. Secondly, the Sixth Commandment does not prohibit homicide in self-defense. You may want to turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. And notice with me what Jesus says 
And this is right before he goes to Gethsemane. This is Thursday evening. He's literally just a few hours from crucifixion or Friday morning at 9 a.m. Jesus makes a fascinating statement, and we are committed to a literal hermeneutic, literal interpretation. There's no room for allegorizing and saying this is symbolic as Roman Catholic theology in the Middle Ages played all kinds of games with this text. This is a literal statement. Luke 22, 36. Here's Jesus. He who has no sword, and the word that Luke uses is the word makaira, which refers to a dagger. It's not a long sword, it's a short sword, a dagger, makaira. He who has no makaira, let him sell his garment and buy one. Self-defense, lest you be murdered. Now, we see Jesus' humanity here. As to his humanity, sound Christology recognizes that he does not know everything as to his humanity. There are numerous passages he doesn't know the time of the second coming. For example, it's a reflection of his full humanity. As to his divinity, he knows all things. But what is in view here is his humanity. He who has no sword, buy one. And then one of the disciples here in verse 38 says, Lord, look, here are two swords. Again, the word makaira. We already have two daggers among us. And so Jesus, as it were, as to his humanity, learns something, picks up on this, and he responds. We read verse 38, and he said to them, it is enough. That's enough. Okay. So the Reformed, and I could name theologians who write about this, do believe that this text, the Sixth Commandment, does not prohibit homicide in self-defense because you, in fact, are stopping a murder from taking place. We come now to to see, it does not disallow killing in a time of war. We're talking here about a case of unrighteous aggression by a nation which invades another nation intent upon murder and robbery. In that situation, it is the right of the people to defend their lives and their property. For example, September 1st, 1939, Nazi Germany invaded Poland to the east, which was living in peace with them, basically because the government said, we want your stuff. It was the right of the Polish people to rise to the defense. They were unsuccessful to defend their liberty, their lives, their families. We see a lot of this in the Old Testament. We see it in Genesis 14 with Abraham. We see it many times with David, for Samuel 23. And we also see it in the New Testament. In Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 32, where the writer mentions great military men of the past, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David. And he says this, who through faith, listen to this, who through faith became valiant in battle turned to flight the armies of the aliens. You see, it was through their faith in the Lord that incredible strength was given to these great military men. Martin Luther, in a very famous treatise entitled Whether Soldiers Too Could Be Saved, reflected on these issues in an outstanding piece careful handling of scripture. I've given you a short selection of it. There 
in your bulletin, bulletin insert at the top, it says part one, Czech and German reformers. Paragraph three down at the bottom, this is page 14. Let me read a few sentences from Martin Luther. Quote, now slaying and robbing do not seem to be works of love. A simple man therefore does not think it is a Christian thing to do. In truth, however, even this is a work of love. Now that's an amazing statement. Slang can be, in a certain situation, a work of love. What does Luther mean by that? Well, he uses the example of a doctor in the 16th century. Note what he says. For example, a good doctor sometimes finds so serious and terrible a sickness that he must amputate or destroy a hand, foot, ear, eye to save the body. Looking at it from the point of view of the body which the doctor wants to save, he is a fine and true man and does a good and Christian work as far as the work itself is concerned. See, at first glance, if you walked into a room and you saw an amputa amputation, you would think this is a horrific act, but in reality, it is designed to save life. He continues, in the same way, when I think of a soldier, listen carefully, we're not talking about a man who just, you know, volunteers and says, I'm a soldier, you know, some insane person, I'm a soldier of God. We're talking about government, soldiers, men who are part of the military, that type of thing. In the same way, when I think of a soldier fulfilling his office by punishing the wicked, killing the wicked, and creating so much misery, it seems an unchristian work completely contrary to Christian love. But when I think of how it protects the good and keeps and preserves wife and child, house and farm, property and honor and peace, then I see how precious and godly the work is. We, the reform, say amen. You're right on target. That is exactly what scripture teaches. And we are thankful for our veterans. You in the congregation who are veterans, we are thankful for you for what you have done. It indeed is a good work. If it is a just war. Now we come to point number three. The nature of the transgression of this mandate. This is the most heinous crime that can ever be committed to violate the Sixth Commandment. Charles Hodge, one of the great Reformed theologians in history, taught at Princeton Theological Seminary in the 19th century, said this, quote, it is the highest crime which a man can commit against a fellow man. Another renowned Reformed theologian from Virginia who lived at the same time, Robert Dabney, said this, if life is thus sacred and is man's one possession of transcendent value, then to take it away without right is an enormous outrage. What has been done in recent days in the United States by rogue police officers and by angry violent mobs are crimes of the highest magnitude before God. We have seen enormous outrages in recent days. But we must remember as we come to 3a that it is a sin that can be committed in the heart. Jesus is very clear about this in Matthew 5. Notice with me what he says, and you know this passage, Matthew 5, 21 and 22. He contrasts rabbinic interpretation and his interpretation. And we come once again to the issue of proper biblical interpretation. This is a very serious thing, handling the scripture 
And to misinterpret the scripture is a very serious thing. May God spare us from doing that. The scriptures are plain. They must be understood literally. And the rabbis really messed up in their handling of the sixth commandment. And Jesus says this in Matthew 5, note verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old. Verse 22, but I say to you. Rabbinic interpretation just left it at the outward, the literal, that this is just civil law, but it's more than just civil law. The government is theocratic, and these commandments reach into the heart. Here's Jesus, Matthew 5, 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. That is the civil courts. But notice what he says. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. He is speaking here about the judgment of God and he's really going to the deeper issue which leads to this sin, anger. Now we have to be very careful here because not all anger is necessarily sinful. We read in Mark 3, 5 that Jesus looked around at them with anger and Jesus never sinned and, and we have other passages which talk about the anger and the wrath of God, which is holy and there's no sin. So what is Jesus talking about? Charles Hodge at Princeton Theological Seminary, I think is right on target when he talks about anger and the fact that at times it is allowable. And he actually says that it is a natural emotion uh, arising out of the perception of wrong and the realization that there must be punishment. I think we all had anger in terms of what happened in Minneapolis and in the aftermath on the part of mobs let loose. It's an emotion. Malice, though, is different. Charles Hodge points out, he says malice is always sinful. It includes hatred and the desire to inflict evil to gratify that evil passion. That's a different thing. Jesus says that if you have that, you in fact are in danger of the divine judgment. And the idea there in that word is the divine condemnation. We've seen a lot of malice in recent days and the rioting and the violence against the innocent and the smashing of windows, burning cars and buildings, throwing bricks at police, malice. Jesus Christ says, you're in danger of the divine condemnation. There may be someone here listening on the World Wide Web and if you were honest with yourself, you would have to admit that you have malice in your heart. In fact, you cannot say, and if you did say it, you'd be a total hypocrite, you cannot say what Abraham Lincoln said in his second inaugural in 1865, quote, with malice toward none, with charity for all, you cannot say this because you have malice in every direction and you don't have charity. It's not part of you. Now Jesus says that you are in danger of the divine judgment unless you repent, unless you change. Two men. Everybody here knows who these men are. Clarence Thomas. Justice on the U.S. Supreme Court, Dr. Ben Carson, the renowned pediatric neurosurgeon, U.S. Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, both speak about how God took anger, malice, out of their hearts. Justice Thomas said, quote, I saw what I had become. This is when he was in his 20s. He was at his undergraduate studies in Massachusetts at Holy Cross. 
He'd become an extreme left-wing Marxist. I saw what I had become, lashing out at every single thing, and I asked God, if you take anger out of my heart, I'll never hate again. God answered that prayer. And then the case of Dr. Ben Carson, who was really filled with malice already at the age of eight. He attempted to stab one of his friends. And it's almost a miracle that the friend did not die. Ben Carson then spent two hours in the bathroom crying out to God for help. And then he read Proverbs 16, 32. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. He said this, quote, At last I stood up, placed the Bible on the edge of the sink. I washed my face and hands, straightened my clothes, I walked out of the bathroom a changed young man. So God really does. It's amazing. This comes from a president, not a theologian, but a political philosopher, Abraham Lincoln. He really shows us how to live with malice toward none, with charity for all. Now we come to point 3B. It can be perpetrated unwittingly. Luther speaks about this in his small catechism. Simply makes the point we should not endanger our neighbor's life. The issue here is risky behavior. God is not pleased with daredevils and stuntmen who endanger their own lives. We all remember evil Knievel, who made a living risking his life, jumping cars and buses with his motorcycle, and breaking more bones than we can even number. Listen to the Heidelberg Catechism 105. What does God require in the Sixth Commandment? Quote, that I do not harm myself nor willfully, willfully run into any danger. And finally, nothing is more heinous and devilish. Let's think about why this is the case. Well, man bears the image of God, and human life is sacred. That, in fact, is the idea found in Genesis 9-6. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. And then here's the reason, for in the image of God, he made man. Every human being is a picture, a reflection of God. Great Puritan theologian Thomas Watson, 17th century, said, quote, Life is the most precious thing, and God has set this commandment as a fence about it to preserve it. In fact, to strike at man is, in a sense, to strike at God. We bear the image of God. Watson said, quote, it is tearing God's picture. That's what it is. Furthermore, it is the fundamental deep antithesis of our great duty, you shall love your neighbors yourself. And also, it intrudes upon the divine prerogative because God alone can give life and God alone can take life. Man cannot create life. We just cannot do that. It is a miracle. And man has no right to destroy that life which God has created. Furthermore, it really involves theft. Robert Dabney says that it is to steal man's one possession of transcendent value. Think about the consequences of this apart from repentance. 
And God is able and has saved people who have fallen into this sin. We know that. But apart from repentance, we read in Revelation 21.8, murderers shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The good news is Jesus is willing to save the person who has so deeply fallen, who will call upon him for salvation. It's the amazing thing about our God. Think about the highest crime ever committed, and it was perpetrated against our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the New Testament says that it was murder. Stephen says this in Acts 7.52 when he refers to Jesus as the just one, he says, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. You have become his murderers. Think about the fact that Jesus lived his entire life knowing there are indications of this. There are texts in the Gospels which show this. He knew that he would be murdered. He knew this was the plan of God, that his blood would be shed, he would die a violent death, all to wash away our sins. You and I don't really know, unless we have a terminal disease, you and I don't know how we're going to die. But he did, did know this, and this was part of his suffering. And he did this for us. Incredible suffering. You may be going through trials, tribulations, difficulties right now. In these days of trial, remember that you are loved by God. Spend some moments in your most comfortable chair at home, meditating on the love of our Lord Jesus Christ who is willing to suffer in your place. And may we live and die with the same assurance in our hearts as reflected in Galatians 2.20. Paul says, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's what Paul thinks about when he thinks about Jesus Christ. He's the one, he's the Son of God and he, in fact, loved me, gave himself up for me, and now I live by faith in the Son of God. If that is true, if you have faith in the Son of God, you have a glorious future. You know what you and I can say? We can say, what Paul says in 2 Timothy 4.18. Listen to these words he's speaking about Jesus. The Lord will bring me safely. Isn't that a beautiful word? An adverb. The Lord will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. That is our future.